During the late 1980s and early 1990s, a janitor and Civil War reenactor was leading an unremarkable life on the surface. Underneath this facade was a disturbed man and cold-blooded killer. After abducting numerous women and girls, he would finally be arrested in 1994 for the kidnapping of a 15-year-old girl who was eventually found murdered across state lines. After numerous interrogations, he confessed to several murders he'd committed, only to recant them. And when he's on his second appeal, a federal prosecutor gets an idea. Find someone inside the prison system to get him to confess. This is a story of memory, manipulation, murder, and a man who almost had the goods on possibly the worst serial killer in America's Midwest. This is Larry Dwayne Hall, the true story of Blackbird, part one. Hey, y'all, I'm Chris Calvert. And I'm her husband, Rob Potter. Welcome to Hitch to Homicide. For better or worse. Till death do us part. everybody. Yes, welcome, 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 and for our friends in Bengali. (laughs) Have we done this one before? No, this is a new one. I'm just joking, Bengali. (laughs) Shagata, shagata, shagata. Very nice, Bengali. Welcome. Yep. Well, wherever you're listening, be sure to hit that subscribe button. Then like, rate, and review the podcast so other people who love true crime just like you can find us. Yep. And if you're watching us on YouTube, hit that subscribe button below. You can find us on Instagram at Hitch2Homicide or on X at H2H underscore podcast. And if you want true crime with us all the time, every single day, 24-7, <laughs> please go join our closed Facebook group, The In-Laws and Outlaws. Go to Facebook, type in H2H, In-Laws and Outlaws, answer a couple questions and you're in. Go join. We love it in there. It's my favorite place to be. It's a bunch of wacky people. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> We also now have a buy me a coffee link if you want to send Rob some coffee. He drinks it every episode. Absolutely. You can find that link in our show notes. You can also send Chris and Rob a text. That's also in the show notes at the very top. So hit that link and send us a little message. We appreciate all of your messages and emails. Thank you for being with us every single week. (laughs) We're here, so you might as well. (laughs) More than one person has suggested this case. And I did a deep dive and needed to separate it into two parts, but I think it will be worth it. Okay. Apple did a series called Blackbird, and that is the true crime story we're talking about. That one is a little bit fictionalized. I'll point out some of the places if you've watched that series. But um, very interesting. And the guy who plays the subject of our podcast today actually won... A Golden Globe and an Emmy Oh wow! for his performance. Okay. Before we get started, let me thank some sources. All that's interesting, Colander.com, History vs. Hollywood, Digital Spy, Web Sleuth, The Midwest Crime Files, The People vs. Hall, WTHR in Indiana, MyWabashValley.com, NBC News, The Columbia Tribune, The Charlie Project, Wish TV in Indianapolis, FBI.gov, the Indianapolis Star, the Network.org, Medium.com. I'm almost finished. <laughs> <laughs> Vocal Media, Vlad TV, and there is a book, In With the Devil, A Fallen Hero, A Serial Killer, and a Dangerous Bargain for Redemption by James Keene. Okay, well, you ready? After all of that, <laughs> I am. All right, let's do it. On December 11th, 1962, Larry and Gary Hall are born to Robert and Era Hall. I also read that her name was Beatrice in Wabash, Indiana, which just immediately, I don't know why, it just made me think of like SpongeBob or something, Larry and Gary. (laughs) I don't know. It did. Gary was born first, Larry a few minutes later. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Larry and Gary were monochorionic twins, hmm, which mean? means they shared a placenta. Oh. And the problem with that is that Gary got most of the nutrients and oxygen during their mother's pregnancy. Gotcha. And Larry got whatever was left over. Larry got the short end of the stick. He did. And after Larry is born, he's rushed into the neonatal intensive care unit. I think even with being in the back of the line while his mom is pregnant, during birth, he was deprived of oxygen on top of that. Oh, wow. And that caused some brain damage. Mm -hmm. It's called hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, Mm -hmm. H-I-E. Okay. And it affects the central nervous system. All right. Babies born with HIE have neurological and developmental problems. And Larry will later tell people that his brother Gary fed on him. (laughs) And that's why he was smarter and more athletic. Okay. (laughs) Nice logic, but uh, whatever. I'm Larry and this is my brother Gary. (laughs) And he fed on me. This is, I'm Daryl and this is my other brother Daryl. A little bit. (laughs) Right. Right. Larry and Gary grew up at the Falls Cemetery in Wabash, Indiana, where their father, who was actually a Navy World War II vet, was the grave digger there at the cemetery. Oh, okay. He's the caretaker or the sexton of the cemetery, which meant they had a house to live in there on the cemetery grounds. Gotcha. And there are sources that say that Larry's father was an alcoholic and he's also abusive. And that his mother was domineering. She was a stay-at-home mom who kept a cluttered house. It's a little bit of a dysfunctional family. Mm. Later on, his mother, Larry and Gary's mother, but in particular Larry, because that's who we're talking about, their mother was like uh, this person who was so big she didn't leave the house. Oh, geez. Yeah. As a child, Larry had a lot of medical issues because of his underdevelopment as a fetus, and he suffered from cognitive delays. He had a speech impediment. He had a hard time learning in school. He was a bedwetter late into his childhood years. By the time he's 12 and attending West Ward Elementary School, he and his brother are helping their father at the cemetery, mowing grass, picking up, and digging graves. Oh, wow. And maybe, just maybe, if you have a kid like Larry, you might not want to expose him to dead bodies. Yeah. (laughs) Important safety tip. But Larry was exposed to these dead bodies, and he suffered from terrible night terrors. Mm. And when he's actually tested later on in his life, Larry will only have an IQ of 80. Okay. Larry is bullied in school, and he was always compared to his brother, who was really good in sports and did really well in school, while Larry was an outsider who didn't know how to be social, and he had some poor hygiene habits. His classmates called him the stinky kid. Oh, wow. And while his brother Gary is thriving in school and such a good kid, Larry is falling behind and is, according to his brother Gary, evil. Oh, wow. Larry is going to try to kill his brother on more than one occasion. Good grief. Quote, I just woke up out of a sound sleep to see my brother standing over me with his humongous long limb getting ready to smash my skull, end quote. Wow. And I looked this up. Children who have traumatic brain injuries, TBI or HIE, they're both brain injuries. They're linked to earlier onset criminality. Really? They are six to eight more times likely to be arrested by the time they're 17. Do they know why? Because they've their brain's been rattled around or they've had oxygen deprivation. Yeah. yeah. I, I wonder why it's headed toward criminality, though. That's That's weird. Don't know. Yeah. As for the tree limb, Larry put it down, and the two went on as if absolutely nothing had happened. (laughs) Wow. And by their teen years and during the 1970s and 80s, Larry was stealing. A lot of the time, he's stealing things off dead people. Mm. He and his father were putting in the ground. Now, I don't know if his dad was a part of this, because in the series, his dad is like, get down there and do your job, like climb in there and get the watch and get the ring and stuff. But regardless, Larry's really desensitized early to being around dead bodies. Right. 
He was vandalizing. He was setting things on fire all within his hometown. When he's 15, Larry and Gary both are caught breaking the windows of a store. And according to the local police, quote, it took a long time before we could crack the Hall brothers. They were just kids, but they held up better than hardened criminals, end quote. (laughs) Really? Yeah. Wow. Wow. And these two, even though they are really different and Larry has tried to kill Gary, they are best friends. Gary takes up for Larry. He's kind of his guardian a little bit. Sure. And they have that twin thing, that twin magic stuff. Right. Now, even though Larry isn't doing well in school, he does love history, particularly Civil War and Revolutionary War history. Hmm. And I also read that Larry and Gary's father was an abusive alcoholic. There is a story that Larry's dad drank so much that he lost his job because he was putting bodies into the wrong graves. (laughs) Oops. That'll get you fired at the cemetery. Yeah. Yeah, minor details. And subsequently, the family had to move out of the house on the cemetery grounds and into a one-bedroom shack where I read it was, quote, miserable. Wow. When Larry graduates from high school, he gets a job as a janitor working for a man named Robert Heath. Robert was a good friend of Larry and his brother, and he was a World War II Marine, and he owns this cleaning business that Larry is going to work for. And Larry really likes working with the chemicals and playing around with them and playing a bit of mad scientist. (laughs) And he'd already done some of this at the cemetery as well. That's called foreshadowing. Uh Uh-oh. Ready? Hang on, Scotty. Yes, and I know it's early, (laughs) and this is two parts, but we'll be coming back to that. All right. And remember I told you he's into Civil War and Revolutionary War. He's such a Civil War buff that he's one of the guys who likes to do Civil War reenactments. Mm. And he does them all the time. And Gary does them with him. They do these together for a little bit. They're crisscrossing the Midwest. And Larry grows these big mutton chops on the side (laughs) of his face to be more authentic. Right. He's a member of the 19th Indiana Union Infantry Volunteers. And he usually plays a private. Okay. Larry's brother Gary has said that since Larry never showered and always smelled bad, he was perfect for the reenactments. (laughs) Typecasting. Yeah, for real. (laughs) But about this time, after he's out of school and he's working as a janitor, Larry also buys himself a van. So seriously, he's a mentally unstable guy who's desensitized to dead bodies and he drives a van. It puts the lotion on. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Can you help me get this in my car? Yeah. I just need a little help here. (laughs) Exactly. He's also living at home, quote, taking care of his mom and dad, end quote. But by the time Larry's 18, girls are starting to go missing, and many of them around areas where Larry has gone to participate in these war reenactments. He would target young girls and women in towns where he attended the reenactments. You see, Larry's a hunter. He liked to watch. He liked to stalk, to Mm. follow, and abduct, and it was usually younger girls. And there would be plenty over the years who would heed that, Don't talk to strangers stuff that you would hear in school. Right. And let's face it, nobody's stranger than Larry. (laughs) Larry has a dependent personality. That's what it's called. He always needs someone around him. Okay. And when his twin brother Gary gets married to a woman named Catherine, Larry really feels abandoned. Because the two of them would do everything together and these reenactments together. And they both like to work on cars and they liked to cruise the town together. But now Gary's married and having children and Larry is all alone. And I told you, he doesn't like to be alone. Right. Larry also likes true crime stories. (laughs) Oh, wow. Really? And he liked to fantasize about solving a true crime case that the police hadn't been able to solve. This doesn't sound promising. But then he likes to fantasize about being a suspect. Okay. Now, there are plenty of us in true crime who have wondered if we could ever solve 
a cold case <laughs> or help solve a cold case. Yeah. But I don't think any of us think about or fantasize about being a suspect. <laughs> a suspect. Yeah. No. Yeah, right. So he's out in his van. He's doing these reenactments. He's he's grown these mutton chops. Mm -hmm. Part of that is to cover up the acne on his face. But he's just going from town to town. He's crisscrossing the Midwest, and he's all alone. And one of the things he likes to do is to scare girls. He likes to follow them in his van. Sometimes he asks them questions. Sometimes he just watches. And sometimes he abducts them. Wow. So he started abducting women and young girls. After he would kidnap his victims, he would sexually assault and murder them, have sex with them again with their dead corpses, Jeez. and mutilate their bodies sexually, leaving them in grotesque states. There are lots and lots of dead bodies over the next decade and a half. Several are discovered strangled, mutilated, and with body parts missing. It's a pattern. And many will say that the victims all looked somewhat alike. Really? Yep. Wow. Now, because there's so many victims, I'm going to tell you once what he did to the girls and women. He used a rag with starter fluid on it. He would keep it in a jar. Okay. That is basically like ether. Uh -huh. And this is how he, had, he subdued these women. Wow. After abducting them, he, he would sometimes have to keep putting the rag in their face to keep them, you know, yeah. from fighting. Sure. Then he would tie them up, take them someplace remote. Then he would rape them, usually strangle them from behind because he couldn't look at them. Then he would rape them again and sexually mutilate the bodies. Mm. He would sometimes leave them out in the open. Others he buried in what is suspected to be really small graves where he used chemicals to decompose or disintegrate the bodies in the ground. Remember, I told you he really likes to play around with chemicals. Yeah. June 1982, 19-year-old Naomi Lee Kidder goes missing from Buffalo, Wyoming. Naomi is hitchhiking from Rawlings, Wyoming to Buffalo, where she was working on a seismograph crew. She's trying to get back to see her daughter. Her body is found September 9th, 1982, partially buried and naked on private land on three mile stock trail by a range rider. So a guy out on a horse mm -hmm. about a hundred yards off the road. Okay. And next to her body was a broken silver colored necklace with a turquoise jade charm in the shape of a triangle. Her clothes are nowhere around her. She's so badly decomposed, they can't tell if she's been sexually assaulted. But they knew she was strangled because there was wire around her neck. Her parents reported her missing on July 1st, 1982. She won't be identified until 11 years later, on March 10th, 1993, by her dental records. A periodontist used her dental records with one tooth because it had a gnarled root, and that's something that's very rare. Mm. Twelve years later, police will find a document with Naomi's name on it in Larry's possessions. Wow. August 6, 1985, Jennifer Lee Schmidt, age 19, is a freshman at Purdue University. She was wearing a white blouse and pink shorts with white flat shoes when she is last seen. She's an electrical engineering student from Dayton, Ohio. She left her apartment near the campus to go and visit with one of her professors. She's last seen talking to an acquaintance at Grant and Northwestern Streets. After this, she vanishes, and her body has never been found. Purdue's campus is 70 miles from Wabash, Indiana, where Larry lives. Mm. August 2nd, 1985, Marcy Fuller Swinford, a 21-year-old mother of four who lived in Terre Haute, Indiana, and had gone out to run errands. She was actually off to exchange some jeans at a Hills department store. Do you remember Hills? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And she was going to the grocery while a babysitter is with her kids. She never returns home. A few days later, her car is found at 12th and Eagle in Terre Haute, and her groceries are actually still inside her car, along with her keys and her purse. Nine days later, on August 11th, 1985, Marcy's body is found in a wooded area near Honey Creek in southern Vigo County, which is on the right bank of the Wabash River. She had been strangled and sexually mutilated. Her killer has never been found. 
Larry Hall lived about three hours away. But Vigo County was having what was called Civil War Days in the summer of 1985. Coincidence? I think not. March 28, 1986, Denise Diane Flum is an 18-year-old senior at Connorsville High School in Connorsville, Indiana. She goes to the site of a party she had attended the night before because she lost her purse, but she never returns home. A few days later, Denise's cream-colored 1981 Buick Regal was found abandoned alongside Tower Road, about three miles away from the site of the party, but there was no sign of Denise. The case went cold for years. In 2020, her ex-boyfriend, a boy named Sean McClung, who was in prison for unrelated crimes, confessed to killing her. Really? But he refused to lead the police to her body. He was terminally ill and died before being tried for the crime. But on his deathbed, this Sean kid, her Mm -hmm. old boyfriend from way back when, told his attorney that he did not kill Denise and was only trying to get out of jail. (laughs) Denise was a star athlete, a gifted artist. She ranked at the top of her class, and she had dreams of becoming a scientist. She was just about to graduate high school and had already been accepted to Miami University in Ohio, where she planned to major in microbiology. Mm. So her ex-boyfriend confessed and then recanted. But you know who was in Connorsville at the time of Denise's disappearance? Let me take one guess. Larry. Larry Hall was in Connorsville at the time for a reenactment. Denise's body has never been found. September 6, 1986, a nude Jane Doe is found in southern Illinois, a town called Belleville. She was known for 21 years as the Summerfield woman after the small community where her body was found in a cornfield. She's found by a farmer. She's been strangled and sexually mutilated and had a bruised neck from being strangled. Her mutilation injuries were similar to Marcy Swinford, who was found in Vigo County, Indiana, just a year before. In 2002, she will be identified as a drifter from California named Ayulia Myla Fiola Chavez. Wow. She went by Lolly. Okay. Ulila, Ulila. So that's Lolly. Yeah. She's 28 years old. Her adoptive mother, who told the authorities they called her Lolly, said that she was a runaway who was on the road a lot, but there was no indication that she'd been living in Illinois. She was from California. In 2017, police found some long-lost DNA, and authorities believed, because of the way that Lolly was murdered and mutilated, that Larry Hall was her killer. Another murderer named Dale Anderson was also a suspect in her murder. Larry later confessed and recanted that he killed Lolly. Hmm. And the DNA sample they had wasn't conclusive. Lolly's murder remains unsolved, although just about everybody believes it was Larry, Larry. including his brother. Three months later, on December 1st, 1986, Kimberly Ann Thompson, age 25, went missing from Champaign, Illinois. Her father dropped her off at the apartment she shared with her boyfriend in the 1300 block of North Market Street. It would be the last time her parents would see or hear from her. Days later, her boyfriend reached out to her parents to say he hadn't seen or heard from Kimberly. And her parents said that Kimberly had learned she was nearing a settlement of between $25,000 and $35,000 in a lawsuit that she had filed against an employer for an injury that she got when she was on the job. And the money was very important to their daughter because it was a check for medical expenses. Mm. And that check was never cashed. Mm. And furthermore, she didn't show up for her last appointment with her attorney. She was a serious girl who grew up with big dreams. Kimberly is the third of four daughters. She was a Girl Scout and a tomboy who played baseball and also played with dolls. And she earned good grades in school. In high school, she held food service jobs and became a member of the Champaign Police Explorers Post because at one time she wanted to be a police officer. Oh, wow. Kimberly's body has never been recovered. Oh, wow. Two months later, on February 24th, 1987, 10-year-old Linda Weldy disappeared near her home in LaPorte, Indiana. Linda's bus dropped her off near her home on McClung Road. It's about 3.30 in the afternoon. She's getting home from school. According to police, her bus driver and other kids saw her walk toward her parents' mailbox, as she did every single day. The bus drove off. 
Linda was supposed to walk about 250 yards down the curved gravel driveway to her home, which was hidden by trees. She would never make it home. Hmm. She was a happy little girl who loved fishing and riding her bike. Her body was found by a farmer three weeks later on March 17th along an abandoned railroad track nine miles from her home. LaPorte, Indiana is 93 miles north of Wabash, Indiana. And I apologize because we don't usually talk. I try not to do cases with children in them, but there's just no way around it with this case. Right. A month later, on March 11, 1987, Diana Jane Braungart, age 18, disappears after finishing her shift at the Venture Store in Crystal City, Missouri, near the Missouri-Illinois border. She worked at the Twin City Mall. She finished her shift at 10 p.m. and was walking to the parking lot where her family's yellow 1982 Ford Escort was parked. Diana was a senior at Festus High School, and she told her co-workers that she needed to get home because she needed to study for a test. Authorities don't think she ever made it to her car. Diana's father was a pastor at the First United Methodist Church, and a witness did see a man talking to Diana in the parking lot before she disappeared. He was 5'10", Caucasian, with dark hair and in his early 20s. A sketch was made, but no one has ever been held accountable, and her body has never been found. Mm. June 4th, 1987, 16-year-old Wendy Louise Felton disappears from her Marion, Indiana home while her older sister drove their parents to the airport. And at first, the Grant County Sheriff's Department assumed she had run away because a suitcase and lots of clothes had been missing. But she disappeared fewer than 25 miles from Wabash, Indiana, and only a few miles away from a reenactment site that Larry had visited. (laughs) Wendy, nor her body, has ever been found. Cynthia Louise Carmack was last seen at a shopping center in the 1000 block of Parkamo Avenue on the west side of Hamilton, Ohio, on June 26, 1987. She's never been heard from again. And few details are available in Cynthia's case, but Hamilton, Ohio, is home to the Fort Hamilton historic site. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. Then on September 21st, 1987, a white female, Jane Doe, was found by a road crew in Lincolnville, Kansas. Her wrists and ankles have been bound with rope, and it's believed that she died between June 21st and August 10th. In 2019, the DNA Doe Project discovered that her name was Michelle Shell Evan Carnell Burton. Okay. She's 22 years old. She disappeared in 1986 from Cherryvale, Kansas, when her family lost touch with her. Larry is listed as a suspect in her case. 19-year-old Paulette Sue Webster was last seen walking home from a friend's house in Chester, Illinois, at 11 p.m. on September 2, 1988. She's not been seen since, and authorities initially believed she left on her own, but now they believe that Larry abducted her and is involved in her case. Right. No body has ever been found. Hmm. June 2nd, 1989, 23-year-old Penny Dawn Lease is last seen leaving the Omni Fitness Center in Urbana, Champaign, Illinois. Larry Hall frequently visited college towns looking for victims, and Urbana, Champaign is home to the University of Illinois. Right. He's already been there once. She is declared legally dead in 1996, but her body has never been found. June 26, 1989, 26-year-old Lynn Ann Thompson was last seen at her home in the Prairie Creek area of Vigo County, Indiana. She has never been seen or heard from again. And after her disappearance, her gray Pontiac coupe was found in the parking lot of a Kmart store on South US 41 and Davis Drive in Terre Haute, Indiana. There was no sign of Thompson at the scene. Strangely enough, prior to her disappearance, Lynn told her family to pursue a case if she ever became missing. Really? Which to me says she was being followed. Yeah, yeah. Terre Haute is near a reenactment site that Larry Hall regularly visited. Lynn Thompson's body has never been found. August 5th, 1989, 17-year-old Tracy Marie Crow was last seen at the Alex Acres Trailer Park in Halifax, Pennsylvania. It's 10 p.m. 
She is seven miles from her parents' home. She'd gone to see her sister. Tracy's car will be found in Millersburg Town Square in Millers, Millersburg, Pennsylvania. Her purse was missing, but there was no indication of foul play on or around the vehicle. Okay. Her ID, her National Honor Society card, and other parts of her wallet were found in a remote area along, and I'm going to try to get this right, Wiconisco Creek, Washington Township, nine miles from her home. Neither Tracy nor her body have ever been found. Larry Hall had visited the region in 1988, the year before, for the 125th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. And again in 1989, when she disappeared, when Tracy disappeared. Right. So it was a place he went to a lot, which makes sense. Yeah. He's a Civil War buff. He's going to do Gettysburg Battle. Sure. October 1st, 1989, 28-year-old Janet Rose Dolgay is last seen wearing her work shirt and dress pants in the 500 block of Easterly Road in Cortland, Ohio. It's believed she was dressed to go to work because she worked as a hostess at a restaurant in a place called Niles, Ohio. Okay. She's never been found. Her body has never been found. February 1991, a Jane Doe is found in Frederick Creek, Virginia. Larry Hall was a suspect because he was there in the area at the time doing a reenactment. Yeah. A month later, on March 2nd, 1991, 29-year-old Julie Dalton Johnson's light blue Chevrolet was found abandoned along Indiana State Road 22 near County Road 300 East in Howard County. She had taken her four children to a movie that Friday night took them home and tucked them in, and then disappeared. Hmm. Her husband reported her missing on Saturday. Her car was found less than 35 miles from Wabash, Indiana. Her body has never been found. Wow. Then on July 1st, 1991, first off, I just want to say, I am going to say these girls' names. I always say this. I'm sorry if this is boring to you, but the, these are people's actual lives. These are their real right. lives. Yeah. This actually happened. This guy's a monster, and we just I just always want to say their names. So I always want to say their names. Yeah, we want to honor them. That on July 1st, 1991, 20-year-old Michelle Dewey is sunbathing with her son and waiting for a babysitter in Indianapolis, Indiana. The sitter called police after seeing blood, and Michelle's son was found in a closet untouched. Larry visited Indianapolis that day after seeing a sales ad for a 1980 Blue Dodge van. He's driving a brown and tan van. Okay. He's looking for or looking at a Blue Dodge van. All right. They think he spotted Michelle in the yard and then went into her house and murdered her by strangulation. Indianapolis police continue to investigate Michelle Dewey's murder, and still to this day, they seek anyone who has an auto trader or Wheels and Deals magazine from the last two weeks of June through the first two weeks of July 1991. Wow. Police believe the ad brought Larry Hall to Indianapolis was in one of those papers. Okay. And they're looking for the person who listed the ad and may have spoken to Larry on the day that Michelle Dewey died. Right. A family member close to Larry Hall has said that Larry did indeed murder Michelle. And even though police haven't linked Larry to Michelle's murder, his family thinks he did it. Right. So he has, he's admitted to somebody in his family. Right. That same month on July 25th, 1991, Larry picked up a woman in Claremont on the west side of Indianapolis. He remembered the woman did not want to go with him and had to be forced. <laughs> Her name is Georgia Shreve. She's 37 years old. Georgia was last seen at a truck stop in Indianapolis on July 25th. A truck driver found her body on August 5th in a ditch next to the westbound ramp of Interstate 74 at Indiana State Road 25. Hmm. Then in September of 1991, September 6th to be exact, Larry's good friend and employer, Robert Heath, dies. And this made a huge impact on Larry because he really liked Robert. That was kind of his father figure because his dad didn't really care for him that much. Right. And after this, Larry will go to Robert's grave so he can talk to him 
on a regular basis. Hmm. January 9th, 1992, 18-year-old Holly Ann Anderson is found in a field along County Road 1450 near Perrysville, Indiana. She was stabbed at least twice in the chest. She'd been there for about two hours. Her body was found in a ditch on a country road in northern Vermilion County. She was found less than two miles from where Larry Hall will later confess that he dumped an entirely different body. Really? Well, I mean, because this is a totally different way of killing. He, this is a stabbing and not a strangulation. strangulation. Exactly. Uh, okay. Yeah. But her body is found exactly where later Larry's going to say, I dumped a body there. Hmm. March 1992, another young Jane Doe is found in Fulton County, Union City, Georgia. Larry is the suspect in her murder. June 1992, another Jane Doe is found in Berks County, Georgia. Larry is also the suspect in her murder. Then June 7th, 1992, Stacy McCall, who's 18 years old, and Suzanne Streeter, age 19, and Susie's mother, Cheryl Levitt, who is 47, all from Springfield, Missouri, will vanish without a trace from a home in Springfield. And they will be known as the Springfield Three. Stacy and Susie had graduated from high school the night before. All right. Police say the two friends went to Susie's house after attending a few graduation parties. On the day they were reported missing, the house's front door was left wide open. A family dog was left behind, in addition to money, clothing, cars, keys, and other personal items. Yet police say there was no apparent sign of a struggle. Witnesses saw a blonde driving an older Dodge van later on Sunday. The witness said an unseen male voice told her not to do anything stupid. Larry Hall had a Dodge van, similar to the witness's accounts. Yeah, right. Their bodies have never been found, but there are those who think their killer is a man named Dennis Graves or Gerald Carnahan. And the Springfield Three is a story all in itself. Hmm. But there are many people who believe that Larry was their killer. All right. Their bodies have never been found. Yeah. Then two months later, on August 19th, 1992, in Appleton, Wisconsin, I've actually been to Appleton, mm -hmm. a co-worker walked 20-year-old Laurie Jean Deppies to her vehicle after work at the Fox River Mall. Her vehicle was heard coming into the parking lot of her boyfriend's apartment complex. He heard her car come in, right. which is located at 310 West Wilson Avenue in Appleton. Okay. But Jean never entered the apartment. Really? And her boyfriend's sister and her friend searched for Jean in the parking lot to no avail. They did find her car. It was locked with a styrofoam cup of soda sitting on top of it. Yeah. So she got out of the car, she put it on top, and then she got abducted. Wow. Her overnight bag and purse were locked in the car. And a Civil War reenactment was held at Green Gun Mansion, three days before her abduction, not far from Appleton. All right. The mansion is 10 miles away from where she vanished. Gotcha. And Jean is actually mentioned in Larry Hall's diary. Oh, really? Wow. Larry recalled traveling to Wisconsin in November of 1994 in his confession. Larry confessed to her murder in November of 2010. Her body has never been found. How is he just, these bodies just, I mean, is he disintegrating them? Is he? Yeah. Oh, jeez. He's disintegrating them. He's really good. I mean, you know, he's been digging graves since he was 12. Yeah. He's really good with the chemicals. And, you know, I think, this is just me. I think the bodies that are left out in the open, they're usually found in a cornfield. They're usually in a rural area. Right. I think that he has to get out of there fast. Hmm. And if he doesn't have to get out of there fast, he buries them and we never find these bodies. Man. September 5th, 1992, 27-year-old Bridget Pearl Clodfelter leaves her apartment in Smyrna, Georgia. She's walking to a country bar called The Buckboard to meet her sister. Bridget will never make it there. The route she is believed to have taken to the buckboard would have been north on Lake Park Drive, then east on Windy Hill Road. The route to the bar was heavily wooded, and there were nearby sites of a Civil War battle reenactment. It's amazing. 
March 26, 1993, 16-year-old Raina Risen works at the Pine Lake Animal Hospital in LaPorte, Indiana. We've seen more than one girl go missing from LaPorte, Indiana. Mm-hmm. And she was last seen by the receptionist at 6 p.m. Her car was found with the doors locked and the keys in the ignition. Her purse was found on the front seat and her hood was up, but there were no problems with her car. Hmm. Her hair barrette was found next to the car, and her boyfriend's jacket was found six miles away from the car. Wow. Officers say the jacket was not there during their initial search. Oh, really? Fishermen found Reyna's fully clothed body floating in a pond. Someone tried to conceal the body with branches. She'd been strangled but not sexually assaulted, which to me says... He ran out of time. Yeah. In 1994, police did a search of Larry Hall's possessions, and birth control was found with R. Rison on it. Hmm. But her boyfriend, Jason Tibbs, was actually convicted of her murder in 2014. I don't know what to make of that. Right. Why would Larry have birth control pills for Raina? Yeah. And Jason convicted of her murder. So there must be some DNA in there. I don't know what to make of that, but I did want to put her in there. Okay. March 29th, three days later, 1993, 19-year-old Trisha Lynn Reitler is a freshman at Wesleyan University in Marion, Indiana. She left her dorm around 8 p.m. taking a break from writing a term paper to shop at a nearby Marsh supermarket. Mm. I actually lived in Indiana when all of this was going on, by the way. Not the beginning, but in the early 90s, that was where I lived. Wow. Trisha goes to this Marsh supermarket. She purchased a root beer in a Family Circle magazine, and she has never been seen since. Trisha was on an academic scholarship, and she was training to join the track team. She was from Olmsted Township, a small town in Ohio, not far from Cleveland. And when the police investigate, there were reports of a man who looked like Larry Hall lurking around the store before Trisha went missing. And he's hard to miss because he has those big mutton chops, right? Yeah, exactly. Trisha was reported missing a few days later after she was last seen at Marsh, and that's according to her parents. All right. And detectives say that two days later, across the street from the same Marsh store, they found a bag of goods, a receipt from the supermarket. Her clothes were found in this bag with small amounts of blood on them as mm. well. Wow. Trisha's body has never been found, and after Trisha goes missing— Larry clips stories from the newspaper about her. He follows the investigation. Yeah, so now he's fulfilling that fantasy of becoming a suspect. He's he's seeing himself as the suspect in the newspaper. Yeah, exactly. Wow. A few days later in Marion, Indiana, March 6, 1993, 20-year-old Heather Edgett and 19-year-old Kristen Zoller are coming home from a store and heading back to Wesleyan University when they notice a brown and tan van following them. Mm. They ran back to campus. They called a security guard. His name was Officer Beck. The security guard, a former police officer, followed the van and pulled Larry Hall over. And Larry gave this campus officer an address to a friend's house. He says, I'm lost. I'm trying to get to this friend's house. He gives him an address that he's trying to find. Right. But when the officer contacted police for help with this address, go look for this guy. They discover it was fake. It wasn't a real address. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. I mean, he's having some close. Br- now he's he's speeding up. Yeah. He's having more brushes with the law. He's getting sloppy. Yeah. Then on September 19th, 1993, Larry attended a Revolutionary War reenactment at Forest Glen Park in Perryville, Indiana. A day later, on September 20th, 15-year-old Jessie Roach is going for a ride on her new mountain bike in rural Georgetown, Illinois. Okay. After school, her sister Mindy is driving into town. She sees Jessie walking down the road with her bike. She's like walking her bike. And when her sister returns from the store, she calls out for Jessie and she gets no answer, which was really unusual. Mm -hmm. And then she sees Jessie's bicycle lying in the road. Wow. 
a bus driver, his name is Daryl Morgan, was passing by as he did every afternoon, and he also sees this bike lying in the middle of the road, which he thought was really unusual because it was a brand new bike. Sure. And Mindy asked her parents if they had heard from Jesse, and when they said no, they called the authorities. Right. And the police department quickly organized a search party because they'd already had the disappearance of Holly Ann Anderson on January 6th. 1992. So he's sticking around in these same areas. Yeah. Jessica Lynn Roach, she goes by Jesse, is born on November 27th, 1977 in Danville, Illinois. Jesse is the daughter of Charles and Terry Lynn Crunk Roach. She was a student at Georgetown High School and was a member of the Jehovah's Witness Church in Georgetown, Illinois. All right. About six weeks after Jesse goes missing on November 8th, 1993, her decomposed body is found across the state line near Perryville, Indiana. She is unfortunately in a cornfield. It's the fall, and the farmer is combining, oh. and he unknowingly ran over Jesse's body, oh. mutilating it with the farm equipment. Oh, my gosh. So due to the extensive damage caused by both the machine and the passage of time— it was impossible for investigators to be sure of the cause of death. The police were hampered in their efforts to solve this crime because there's no physical evidence. Right. It's not at the scene of her disappearance or where her body was found. The decomposed body was taken to Dr. Roland Kaur for a medical examination and was later positively identified as Jesse Roach. Her autopsy showed she had a broken jaw, probably caused by somebody punching her. Mm. Ten days later, on November 19th, Larry is in Rochester, Indiana, for a Civil War reenactment. So he's near Jesse before he abducts her and again after. So let me ask you a question. He, Because um, I'm thinking about how's he, how's he affording this lifestyle? So does he go back and do his job and then he leaves on the weekends? So all these people right. are being killed on the weekends. and Yeah. yeah. No, wow. he's, he's working as a janitor hmm. and then doing... Um, his reenactments on the weekends. Jeez. Yeah. Okay. Then on December 6th, 1993, landscape workers in Centerville, Virginia, discovered the skeletal remains of a woman in a shallow grave. In 2022, using DNA, they identify her as Sharon K. Abbott Lane. She was last heard from in 1987. Wow. Now, by 1987, Larry is traveling and doing his reenactments. At the very beginning, this is the very beginning. Right. And I looked it up, and even today in Virginia, there are seven different reenactment events. Jeez. Then between March 1994 and November of 1994, Detective Phil Amons of the Wabash Police Department had several conversations with Larry. This is his hometown police department. Really? Larry was being creepy and watching young girls and women from his van. Mm. And apparently, this police officer realizes, you know, they know of Larry right. and Gary. Sure. Wabash isn't that big of a town. Sure. But he realizes that Larry probably has some mental health problems. Because at his recommendation, Larry agreed to see a therapist at the Otis R. Bowen Center. It's a mental health facility in Wabash. Wow. And Detective Amon's kept in touch with the treating therapist and provided him with information about accusations concerning Larry's propensity to bother young girls. Hmm. And in turn, the therapist shared his assessment of Larry's condition with the detective and kept other local law enforcement agencies informed about Larry's treatment. So they're like, he's not really with it. He's one brick shy of a load. Right. He's not doing anything to the girls. He's just talking to them or stalking them, watching them, making them uncomfortable. Leering at them. Right. Yeah. Then on May 29th in 1994 in Georgetown, Illinois, 21-year-old Amy Gossett was out rollerblading when she noticed a brown and tan van passing by her numerous times. It got closer each time. It got slower each time it went by her. And she saw a motorist who she knew. She flags him down, stops that car, and tells them, if you don't hear from me in 45 minutes, call my parents and tell them to call the police. Wow. And she gave them the description of the van. 
I would have just gotten in their car and said, take me home. Well, I guess she's rollerblading. I don't know. But she didn't. She just said, if you don't, I mean, you know, I think she was like, is this creepy guy actually looking for me? You know, I think she got the willies. Yeah. But then she didn't, maybe she didn't want to overreact. Yeah. But she is near the spot where Jesse Roach's body was found. And she's also skating near where Holly Ann Anderson was found. And she remembered the license plate number. Mm. She commits it to memory. Okay. 85B3752, which is registered to? Larry. Larry Hall. Yep. On the very same day, Abby Mirage, who's 13 years old, and Kaylin Hoskins, who was 15, they were riding their bikes when they noticed a tan van (laughs) with brown stripes following closely behind them. The girls cut through an alley to avoid the van to go to Kaylin's house. Abby called her grandmother, and when they got to Kaylin's house, they called the police. Wow. Abby's parents went out looking for the van, and when they found it, the driver turned off his lights because he knew they were watching him. Yeah. The van tried to escape, but he got stopped at a red light, and Abby's mother called the police and gave them the license plate. Now, remember, by now, some people had phones in their cars by 1994. Sure. Like, by 1991, I had a phone inside my car. Right. But her parents are behind this van. They call the police. They give them the license plate, 85B3752, which is registered to Larry Larry Hall. Hall. Yep. Officer Neil Pence stopped Larry Hall after he had driven past some girls several times. He's cited for improper registration. He pulls him over. Mm-hmm. Need to see your license and registration. His, li- his registration isn't current. And because of that, he searched Larry's van. Hello. And while searching Larry's van, he noticed some unusual items, such as a spray can of starting fluid, a cotton mask, and cotton balls a plastic tarp, some knives, and a length of rope, a knife, a ski mask? Seriously? Yeah. The officers also found newspaper articles about Trisha Reitler. Remember, he's following this case. And a piece of Indiana Wesleyan University stationery with Trisha's name printed on it. Oops. They also find a note mentioning Menominee Public Access, which is just a half a mile upstream from where Carrie Smith's body is found. Right. So all kinds of clues in this van, right? Yeah. yeah. But this guy doesn't really know what he's looking at because he has crisscrossed over all these state lines in between Illinois and Indiana. Sure. So the right hand doesn't necessarily know what the left hand is doing. Sure. A day later, on May 31st, 1994, Ashley Davis, Tisha Moore, Danielle Marshall, and Melissa Selleck were walking in Wabash City Park when they noticed a brown van driving next to them. The driver asked them if they wanted to go for a ride. (laughs) The girls got scared and ran to Ashley's house, and her mother yelled at the man as he's driving off. Melissa Selleck told police after the incident that the man with the dark hair and the mutton chops had tried two other times to coax her into his van. Two other times in that day, other than that day. Good grief. Her father goes out looking for the van and found the same van, which was registered to Larry Hall, and police searched a barn that Larry had been using to work on his vehicles. And when they get there, they find straps suspended in the barn that were thought to have been used as restraints. Wow. A month later, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, on June 30th, 1994, 32-year-old Donda Renee Martino was talking with her sister when she said she was going to run to the store and told her she'd call her back when she gets gets home. Okay. No one has heard from her since. Mm. The next day, there was a family birthday party and Dondra never showed, which they knew something was wrong. Right. Her husband said he hadn't seen her since she left for the store. There are various Civil War battles going on in the region, and Larry, of course, is a suspect in her disappearance. Of course. Then two weeks later, on July 15th, 1994, 14-year-old Sarah Ray Bohm was on her way to a friend's house in Beaver County, Pennsylvania. She's never going to make it there. And police first thought she was a runaway, but then her family and friends knew that she wasn't. 
a hunter found skeletal remains near Deerfield, Ohio, at Berlin Lake in Portage County. In May of 2001, FBI agents obtained a DNA sample from Sarah's mother and submitted the sample to the lab for testing. And in 2003, the remains were actually identified as Sarah. Mm, Sad. Larry is a suspect in her murder. So even after the police have like pulled him over and talked to him and done all this stuff, he is still going to these reenactments and he is still picking up women and girls and killing them. Well, first of all, he's not a very smart man. And second of all, he keeps getting away with it. So those those two things in combo, it seems like a perfect recipe. I mean, he's a serial killer on the move. Yeah. But yet, if you knew that all, if you ever put together that the murders were happening near these Civil War reenactment sites, you'd have to put those two things together. And why would you ever put those two things together? Right. Nine days later, on July 24th, 1994, 13-year-old Natasha Crockett and her 10-year-old sister, Nicole, were playing with their cousins across their home, across the street from their house, when they noticed this brown and tan colored van parked across the street. And the driver was writing something down. And the van pulled up to the girls and asked them if they knew where Woodlawn Street was. And I don't know if you remember this or not, but that's the exact same false street that he gave before to the campus police. Right. When they said no, the man asked Natasha if she would like to go for a ride. They say, they say, no, thank you. They run into their house and the girls tell their parents about the van. And when the van is driving by their house one more time, the parents get the license plate, 85B, 3752. Yep. It's Larry Hall. Wow. So they know this guy is doing this, yeah. but he's in different areas when he's doing it. They really know for sure in Wabash that he's being creepy. Right. Two weeks later, on August 8th, 1994, 18-year-old Shailene Marie Farrell left their home in Piqua, Ohio oh. to go to a pick-and-save grocery store. Her 1981 Chevrolet was found in the parking lot. She has never been heard of or found. And because she fits the profile of Larry Hall's victims, he is thought to be a suspect in her disappearance. That's right next to my hometown. That is very close to Rob's hometown. Wow. Later that month, on August 21st, 1994, the nude body of 17-year-old Catherine Menendez, a rising high school senior in Beloit, Ohio, was found by a gas company employee working near the Berlin Reservoir in Portage County. The autopsy showed she had been raped, tortured, sexually mutilated, and strangled to death. In the November that followed, the remains of Sarah were found less than a mile away from where Menendez was dumped. Wow. And less than two months after the murder of Catherine Menendez, another girl was found murdered in Rochester, Indiana, with similar mutilation injuries. Her name is Carrie Ann Smith. October 9th, 1994, Carrie Ann Smith was found on the north side of Tippecanoe River in Rochester, Indiana. She was last seen in South Bend, Indiana, where she lived. An autopsy revealed that she had been beaten, strangled, and sexually mutilated. He does the exact same things yeah. to all these girls. Right. And police speculated on where Smith had been murdered because there was no evidence on the bridge or the riverbanks. Okay. October 22nd, 1994, Nicole Brecker and Danielle Mullins, who are both 14 years old, were visiting a nearby store in Georgetown, Illinois, when a van pulled into the parking lot. Georgetown, Illinois is where Jesse Roach was abducted off of her bicycle. Okay. The girls see this van. They take off running. The man follows them, asking them, why are you running? Do you want to ride? Why are you running? I'll give you a ride. Jeez. They called police. They give the plate number, and they discover the driver is Larry Hall. October 28th, 1994, Detective Sergeant Whitmer of the Wabash Police Department receives a fax Remember when he used to get a fax? (laughs) Exactly. He gets a fax from Gary Miller at the Vermilion County Sheriff's Department in Georgetown, Illinois. And the message stated that Detective Miller was interested in discussing two attempted abductions in his county. Did Wabash police know a man by the name of Larry Larry Hall? Hall? 
And Sergeant Miller told Sergeant Whitmer that in both attempted abductions, the young girls had identified a tan and brown van with a license plate number of 85B3752. And when he ran the plate, he said, you're right, it's Mm -hmm. registered to Larry Hall. He also told them about the unsolved murder of Jesse Roach. And Sergeant Whitmer knew Larry Hall and asked if there were any military reenactments in the area (laughs) during that time. The walls are starting to close in. Finally, they're starting to close in. Yeah. Three days later, on November 2nd, 1994, Detective Miller arrived in Wabash for an interview with Larry Hall. He's come from, from Illinois. Okay. He was joined by investigators that were looking into the disappearance of Trisha Reitler. She disappeared from Wesleyan, right? Mm -hmm. She was in college. And when they get Larry in a room to question him, he was very soft-spoken. He was quiet. His demeanor was just very low-key. There were no outward signs that he was mentally incapacitated, that he, he had any sort of disturbing behavior. Right. Detective Miller told Larry he was there because some girls in Georgetown, Illinois, had reported someone in a van had harassed them. And Larry acts all confused, and he's like, I don't know what they're talking about. I haven't even been in Georgetown. (laughs) I haven't been in Georgetown, Illinois. I haven't even been in Illinois for a really long time. And Detective Miller began by questioning Larry about the October incident in Georgetown, but he soon returned to the Jesse Roach case. And it's worth noting that Detective Miller had, by this time, taken a statement from another person who had confessed to abducting Jesse Roach and dumping her body in the cornfield. Okay. But Larry initially denied ever seeing Jesse, and then Detective Miller gets really upset with Larry's responses, so he moves closer. You know, we talk about yeah. this, this interrogation technique. Right. He moves closer to Larry, and he starts suggesting the, quote, right answers <laughs> as the questioning gets more intense. Right. During this questioning, nobody physically abused Larry, but at some point, Larry starts crying. (laughs) And when they take a break, Larry asked Officer Amones, the guy, remember, he's the guy who sent him to talk to the therapist. Right. He asks him during a break, what do they want from me? And after two and a half hours or so, the police allowed Larry to leave. (sighs) Then four days later, on November 6, 1994, a Jane Doe is found in Coopersville, Michigan, by hunters. The police don't know how long she's been there. She's a Jane Doe until 2022 when she's identified as Shelley Ray Christian, who was last seen in Grand Rapid, Michigan, in February of 1994. Then on November 15th, the police tell Larry, we need to question you again. We need to talk to you again. Right. Detective Miller comes back from Illinois, from Georgetown, Illinois, to Wabash. And with him, he's brought special agent Ken Temples of the Springfield FBI office. And Temples was involved in the Jesse Roach murder investigation because her body was abducted in Illinois and her body was found across the state line in Indiana. That's not good. A detective Whitmer drove to Larry's house and asked him to meet with him and some officers. Larry was advised of his Miranda rights and signed a waiver of his rights. This session lasted from around 10 a.m. that morning until about 3.20 a.m. the next morning. Gee whiz. Wow. Wow. Larry refused to take a polygraph during that time. FBI was just hankering to give it to him. The FBI agents interrogated him alone for about two hours. Larry was asked questions about Jesse Roach, about her abduction, and they showed Larry a photo of Jesse Roach. And after seeing the photo, Larry hung his head and began to cry. Really? And recounted the events of September 20th. 1993, saying that he had picked up Jesse while she was riding her bike. He raped her and killed her by putting a belt around her neck and a tree and pulling tight. Quote, I leaned her against a tree and wrapped a belt around her neck until she stopped breathing. Wow. She was crying and asking for her mother, end quote. Oh, my gosh. And that made Larry mad. Really? Yeah, because she was asking for her mom. Oh, my God. When he strangled her, he stood behind the tree because he didn't want to see her face. Right. And in another 20 or 30 minutes later, 
he began making admissions about his involvement in the Trisha Reitler case. Larry said that he'd kidnapped and raped Trisha. He drove her around, got lost, and then strangled her like Jesse and left her body near a creek. Larry signed a confession admitting to abducting and murdering Jesse Roach and Trisha Reitler. When he pointed to Trisha's photograph, he said, quote, all of the girls looked alike. I can't remember all of them. Oh I gosh. picked up several girls in other areas, but I can't remember which ones I hurt, end quote. Wow. They searched Larry's house and his van one more time, and they find a note saying, this is a note he's written to himself, right. quote, Marsh, seen many nice girls at Marsh's, end quote. Well, where was Trisha Reitler abducted yeah. from? Marsh. Marsh. Larry tells them, quote, I went to Anderson, Indiana, and the same thing happened. I went to the car shop in Indy, and I picked up a girl, end quote. He's talking about Michelle Dewey, the girl who was sunbathing at her own house right. and waiting for the babysitter. Yeah. There were no notes, tape recordings, or video recordings of the session. What? It lasted all this time, and there was no recording of the <laughs> session. <laughs> Instead, FBI agent Randolph wrote out a statement in narrative format and asked Larry to sign it. And Detective Miller was present for at least part of this questioning and continued to talk with Larry for an hour or so after the statement was signed. Mm -hmm. Larry Hall was booked into the Grant County Jail at 3.25 a.m. on November 16th, 1994. His signed confession lasted 12 hours. Mm. The next day, Larry meets with Dr. Jim Cates, a clinical psychologist. But instead of being counseled after admitting to murder, Larry recants his confessions and tells Detective Gary Miller, quote, I was just sharing my dreams with you. None of that actually happened, end quote. Jeez. And that is part one <laughs> of the real Blackbird, Larry Hall. Next week, part two. That's all I got to say about that. For nearly seven years, Jane Doe has lived in the shadows, her past buried deep beneath layers of secrecy and silence. After completing more than was asked of her in her last assignment for the enigmatic Kai Wolf Project, Jane Doe vanished without a trace leaving behind a trail of dead bodies and unanswered questions. But now, as the specter of her past returns with a vengeance, Jane finds herself thrust back into a world she thought she'd left behind forever. When her former sins come knocking on her door, Jane is faced with an impossible choice. Continue to hide in the shadows, or once again take up arms against the forces that threaten to tear apart the fabric of society. With enemies lurking around every corner and allies who may not be what they seem, Jane must rely on her wits, training, and her unyielding determination to survive. And while trust is a luxury she cannot afford, Jane must confront the truth about herself and her past. As the clock ticks, she realizes that the line between family, friend, and foe are razor thin, and in the end, the only person she can rely on is herself. Jane Doe 4, Charlotte is available September 24th, 2024. No name, no regrets, no mercy. This guy's truly a monster. I mean, it's just amazing. He it, just indiscriminately just picking yeah. out girls and killing them. He has a certain type. He really likes them like young and that young. He likes the tweens. Yeah. The tweens and the young girls. I mean, there are a few older women who are like thrown in there. Right. But um, yeah, he, he really does sort of have a type for sure. Well, I can't wait to hear uh, what's going to oh, happen. Oh, it gets good in part two. <laughs> okay. Well, I got some good ones too with a little bless your heart. <laughs> All right, starting with number one, this is called Community Policing. Community Policing. Yes, state troopers in New Jersey didn't have to leave their headquarters to make a pot bust, reports the Associated <laughs> Press. Police say they caught three men lighting up in a car in the parking lot of the trooper station in Tottawa. Woo! 
What? Yep. I mean, who, who, what? Really? <laughs> yeah. Really? Police say they were waiting for another man who was inside the station picking up paperwork. Oh, my gosh. For an impounded car. Yeah. So while he's picking up paperwork, they're just <laughs> they're sparking bl- a doobie. Yeah, they're blazing it up in the car. The four men were charged with drug possession. Okay. <laughs> okay, number two. I love this. Worst bucket list ever. <laughs> Okay. Police said two long lost friends stole items from a Walmart as part of a bucket list. According to the Ocala Star Banner, Andrea Mobley, 36, and Jennifer Denise Morrow, 38, were seen inside a Walmart eating beef jerky. Uh. (laughs) And Morrow had concealed some bathing suits in their purse. All right. And eating beef jerky. Yeah, that's it. Okay. When confronted, Morrow said she and Mobley had been friends for 30 years, but were separated and had just gotten back together. She okay. said, yeah, yeah. She said taking the items was, quote, a bucket list thing on our list of things to do together. To shoplift exactly. together. Yeah. Mobley, who was wearing one of the bathing suits beneath her clothing, oh, said <laughs> putting on the suit was, quote, an impulsive thing as eating the beef jerky. I was like, they're on the car- the carnivore diet to look good in the bathing suit, which is why they chose the beef jerky and exactly. not the chips. All right, number three. This was just called Dumber. Dumber. <laughs> yep. Authorities said a Fairfield, Illinois man was arrested twice in one day. The first time for driving drunk and the second for urinating on the jail after he posted bail. Keith Klein, 45, was taken to the Wayne County Jail at about 3.45 p.m. where he was booked on a charge of drunken driving. What? Yeah. (laughs) About 30 minutes later, after completing the booking process and posting bond, Klein was released, but only briefly. The trooper who booked (laughs) Klein said he watched on the jail's video surveillance system as Klein walked out of the jail and then proceeded to urinate on the steps of the jail's entrance. Oh, my God. <laughs> the trooper arrested Klein again on a charge of disorderly conduct. Yeah. Yeah. Klein posted bond again and made it off the property without a second pit stop. <laughs> so there's your dumb, dumb Don't criminals. pee on the, on the steps of the police department. <laughs> After you made bail. Just amazing. That is dumber. Yeah, pretty much. That is dumber. Yep. Well, if you have a bless your heart or you know somebody's heart who needs blessing, all you got to do is go to hitchtohomicide.com where you'll find a pull-down menu. And while you're there, you can also suggest a case or tell us about your brush with true crime. I cannot wait to tell you second the second part of Blackbird. It's going to be good. The real Blackbird. Can't wait. That's my amazing husband out there. That's my beautiful bride in the booth. Join us next time on Hitch to Homicide. Mm -hmm. Bye, y'all.